Hi, I'm Eric Sitrenbaum, and this is the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group's report on rapid, rapid antigen tests. So the purpose of this report is a little bit different from our usual reports. This is more a discussion of the benefits and shortcomings of the rapid antigen test. Uh, this has been a bit of a topic lately in Canada and in BC partic in particular, where we're potentially on the cusp of starting to use these as part of our uh, COVID management um, approach. Okay, so um, what is a rapid antigen test all about? Well, it's a simpler test that can be done at home by people themselves instead of going to a, a testing facility where they would get a PCR test. Um, and what this graph here shows is why you'd want to do that. So, um, so what you see here is, let's say there's some exposure event, somebody's been exposed and gets some virus, you know, on their um, on their mucous membranes and at some point the individual gets infected some of the cells get infected and the virus starts to replicate and goes through a peak and then tapers off as the immune system starts to handle it now there's a window in there where that individual will show symptoms and there's another window in which they would be infectious um, and uh, so a PCR test would catch a, a wider window than what we're showing here. What an antigen, rapid antigen test is capable of doing is picking up um, basically a large section of the period where somebody is infectious. So they're infectious from here until here. The antigen test is um, sensitive enough to pick up any time the viral load goes above this blue line, which means all the way from here until here. So there's this section in here where you may not even have symptoms, but the antigen test is capable of identifying infection. And it's not a very long period of time, but it's kind of a crucial period of time because uh, that's where you would be unaware of the fact that you were potentially spreading. So that's the, the, the main benefit of them, the, or benefits. They're easier to use. They don't involve a trip to a testing center that may not be very close and they can be done um, by, by you on your own, and, um, and they pick up infection more than just looking for symptoms. Okay, so uh, the concerns about rapid tests. Um, so a typical uh, example is this Abbott Panbio variety, which um, uh, there's you know, a wide range of studies, but generally they're about 90% sensitive for infectious cases. So if your viral load is high enough that you're infectious, then you know 90% of the time these antigen tests will pick up that fact. Um, and so th there's a, a, a very f careful definition of what we mean by um, by infectious here, and it actually has to do with the cycle times in the in a PCR test. Um, but I won't go into the details of that. Uh, I'll just describe basically what what it means, and that is if you have, let's say, 100 individuals that are infected and all of them take a rapid, rapid antigen test, you would find 90% positives and 10% that should be positive that don't come out positive. So we'll call those false negatives. And so this positivity rate, this true positive rate, is what we call the sensitivity. So how well can it pick up an infection that's there? Okay, another concern is that they're not specific enough. So by specific enough, uh, we mean that even if you don't have COVID-19, you might still end up with a positive, uh, a positive rapid antigen test result. And that's because potentially there's something, you know, similar enough to, uh, to a COVID-19 virus in the sample, but it's not a COVID-19 virus that would still trigger a positive result. Uh, and so, uh, typical number is 99.5% uh, uh, specific. And what that means is that if you had a whole group of uninfected individuals, let's say 200 of them, then um, 199 of them would come out as getting a negative uh, rapid antigen test result. And one out of those 200 or 0.5% would uh, falsely be identified as positive. So the true negative rate here this is what we call the specificity the higher that is the better and the rest of those would be false positives so what are the impl implications of a 90 percent sensitivity and a 99.5 percent uh, specificity so the sensitivity if we were replacing pcr tests with antigen tests then a 90% sensitivity would be problematic because we'd be missing a lot of cases instead what we're recommending here in what's 
generally recommended with rapid antigen tests is to use them in context where you're testing people <clears throat> who would not be getting tested otherwise. So the 90% is really a bonus 90% rather than a problematic 10% that you're missing. Um, the the 0.5% false positive rate associated with this 99.5% specificity is problematic because uh, in you know typical prevalence in BC is uh, around uh, 0.1, 0.2. Now that's changing now with Omicron, but that's been the case for the last couple of months. And in that type of circumstance, you'd be getting five times as many false positives as true positives, which means you're putting a whole bunch of people through uh, isolation and getting them to go for a confirmatory PCR test. And, we, you know, that's not ideal. So an alternative protocol has been proposed, and that is that anybody who tests positive on a rapid antigen test take a second rapid test. And now, in order to do, you know, clear analysis on this protocol, we have to make an assumption, and the data is not so uh, so available. I mean, there's there's not a lot of data to tell us whether this is a reasonable thing to assume. But just for the analysis here, we're going to assume that the second test result is independent of the first. So what does that mean? What does independent uh, mean? It means that if you take a first test and it comes back positive, um, that positive result may be a false or a true positive. So let's suppose it's a true positive, you're actually sick. If you then take a second test to just confirm in case, oh, what if that first one was a false positive? Now on the second time that you take it, you now have that same 10% chance of getting a false negative that you had on the first one, and it's going to be independent of whether you got that. So just because you didn't get the false negative on the first one doesn't mean you might not get it on the second one. And that's why out of a total of, let's say, 90 out of 100 people who test positive, genuinely positive on the first test, if they retest, then you'd expect 10% of those 90 to come back with one of these false negatives. And so our, our sensitivity drops from 90 to 81 when we do the second test. But similarly, under the same assumption of independence, the specificity rises now to, well, very close to one, and that's a one in 40,000 uh, rate of false positives. And that's that's one over 200 squared, right? Because it's a, the specificity would require that you get a false positive twice, and that chance each time is one in 200. Okay, so as I mentioned before, if this rapid testing is only done on people who would not have been otherwise testing, this protocol, even at 81%, catches four out of five infections that would have been missed otherwise. So just a quick uh, follow-up on the, this question of you know what it means for it to be independent. Uh, I should clarify and give you an example of how these could be dependent. So for example, imagine if the 90% the sensitivity uh, was due to uh, faulty tests. So imagine one out of every 10 tests was faulty and just just didn't pick up um, any indication that there was COVID in somebody's test uh, vial. So um, if those tests were just randomly distributed throughout all packages, then you would expect um, each test to be independent of the next because there'd be a chance in the next box or in the next test of uh, it, you know, it being faulty, but there would be no reason that the first one being faulty would indicate the second one is. But if you had all of the faulty ones happen to be packaged together, like they were part of the same batch, then you might have a box of, say, 25 of them. And if you took one out of there and it failed, that would indicate that the whole box had, was bad. And so the chance of you getting a false negative on your second test from that same box would be guaranteed. So that would be a case where the, um, the two tests would not be independent of each other, and you would not have this change in sensitivity or specificity, depending on which type of independence was violated. So just a quick visual summary of, of what that means. Uh, here you can see this is a summary of what a single test looks like. So here you have some fraction of the population is infected and the rest is not infected. If you do a single test, then you catch 90% of those who are infected and miss 10%. Uh, 
Uh, at the same time, you correctly identify 99.5% of the uninfecteds as uninfected, but 5.5% of them come back as incorrectly positive. But then if we do the follow-up, the number of infected individuals that you identify has dropped now, and correspondingly, the number of false negatives uh, it goes up. But you'll notice now that the number of false positives has decreased to a tiny sliver here. And so that's just, uh, and this isn't to scale, but it's just to give you a visual impression uh, of the, you know, the sort of calculation that I went through. Okay, so let's just look at some cases, use cases. So for example, let's say um, if there's a COVID exposure in a classroom or, or workplace, what they would do is uh, identify close contacts and encourage those people to get a PCR test. Um, but if you do have an elevated probability that other people in the area that are not close contacts might still get infected, their risk of being infected is now higher than in the background of the population. And so you have, uh, you know, maybe there's it's worth not sending them for a PCR test because there's a lot of resources involved in that. They have to take time off. Um, but maybe a rapid antigen test is a good solution for finding that. So let's see what that looks like in a couple examples. So suppose we have a population, let's say a large population with relatively low prevalence, one in a thousand people are infected. Um, if we test a hundred thousand of those, uh, and I'm using large numbers here just so that the, um, the percentages when turned into individuals come out non-fractions. So we'd expect to have about a hundred of them infectious. So let's take a look at what happens in the single test uh, protocol and in the double test protocol. So out of 100 individuals in this huge population that are infected, we would expect to see 90 of them, that's 90% of 100, uh, come out as true positives. So those are, that's great. Caught some extra cases. Um, and the number of false negatives would be about 10. So you'd miss 10 cases. So clearly this is not something that you'd want to use as a replacement for a PCR test, but this is to supplement it. If you then look at the number of false positives, so this is the problem, is that you now have 500 false positives, which is five times the number of infected you have in the first place. So that's 400 people that you're going, or 500 people additional, that you're going to be sending off for PCR tests to confirm or quarantining, whatever. So when you do the double test, what happens to these numbers? Again, assuming the independence that I described before, you now only pick up 81 out of that 100. Um, and you miss 19 cases, but you're now down to only two or three false positives, which compared to the actual number of positives is, is now pretty small. So let's take a look at a different example. Here is when the prevalence is actually much higher. So this would not be in a broad population, but this would be, let's say, uh, an outbreak at a school or a workplace. And now we are really restricting our our consideration to smaller populations. So let's say it's at a school with a thousand kids and there's a case there and you want to know um, beyond the close contacts how many people are infected or you want to catch a few more of them. So we'd expect that 10 people would be infectious out of this population of a thousand. And so now when we do the uh, the test, well actually so you can do no testing in which case you catch none of them, you miss all of them and there's no false positives, so nobody wastes any time going for a PCR test. If you did a single test, you would catch 9 out of 10 and miss 1 with 5 false positives. So that's still a relatively large, large number compared to how many true positives are there, so it would be uh, pretty good to reduce that, um, that down. And now when you do the second test, you miss one more person because they are uh, falsely test negative. Uh, and so there's two people now that have tested negative, um, but you've reduced your false positives down to essentially zero. You know, one in a, one in a thousand or, or several in a thousand times uh, doing this, you might have one person or something. Okay, so another example, a uh, use case uh, for special occasions. So suppose I want my kids to meet uh, their grandmother for her birthday, and there's no restrictions in place saying that we shouldn't do this, so it's, you know, reasonable to do it, but uh, we're worried about grandma. So uh, what do we do? Well, we can test the child. Well, why not test 
um, myself too, I guess. And if you come out with a positive test, you can cancel. So here you could decide, do you want to do the double test if you come up with positive, or are you willing to be, you know, uh, a little overcautious um, instead of doing a second test? So if the child is infectious, then with a the rapid test, there's a 10% chance that you're going to miss it. But if you'd gone visiting anyway without having done the test, you wouldn't have caught that. Um, so that's, um, you know, a, a still a 10% 10, 10 chance of, of going wrong on this decision, but that's um, better than what it was before, which was a 100% chance of exposing your grandparent. Okay, and what if the child's not infectious? There's a 0.5% chance that you have to cancel even though you didn't need to. And if you don't use the test, well, then there's a 0% chance. So, you know, individuals have to choose you know, where they fall in this decision making. Do they want to use the rapid antigen test and get a little bit of information? Do you want to use a double and guarantee that you're not going to um, cancel unnecessarily, but at a slightly greater risk to grandma and grandpa? Okay, so those are two cases where you might want to use uh, rapid, rapid antigen tests, either, you know, uh, at a, um, a public health level or at an individual decision level. And just here, uh, some other uses. So, um, so as mentioned, supplemental testing of low-risk individuals in an outbreak setting, um, and then as extra layer of protection in these one-off circumstances, like um, either visiting grandparents or gathering in social groups, academic conferences, religious gatherings, etc. Um, oh, in the in the work environments where there's, uh, you know, like the film industry, where you have lots of people interacting and masking isn't always possible. And then, uh, didn't really discuss this, but the same calculations apply as a substitute for PCR testing, for example, where PCR is not available. Not as a PCR replacement in general, but if you can't get PCR in a region because the testing facilities aren't available um, and they, they would have to travel, uh, then this is a good um, alternative. And also to scale up uh, testing, for example, with travelers in an airport where you want to do this quickly and you want to catch extra cases that you wouldn't have necessarily had a policy of testing without the rapid antigen test option. Okay, so uh, key messages here. Rapid tests can detect about 90% of infectious cases. They can detect both asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic in that pre-symptomatic short window of a day or two. And uh, you should be careful when using this not to, uh, you know, use it in a way where you would engage in risky behavior that you wouldn't do otherwise, because then it kind of introduces new risk that you uh, didn't have before. Uh, so best to use this as like an, on, on top of other precautions rather than to free yourself up to do something risky. So false positives, although they can be inconvenience, they can be an inconvenience, they can be minimized if you use the second test. Um, although at the cost of reduced sensitivity. Um, so uh, the number of true positives to false positives, if you're worried about you know, wasting people's time sending them off for confirmatory PCR tests, um, then it's, it's best as the prevalence increases because you'll have a higher ratio of true, uh, true positives caught to uh, false positives occurring. Uh, so yeah, so when uh, whether a rapid test is worthwhile depends on prevalence, um, and that you know that issue with false positives is something to look out for with them. Uh, when worthwhile, rapid tests should be available and affordable. We've had this problem in BC. Personally, I just uh, managed to get some for uh, you know not so not so cheap, probably uh, five times the lowest price I've heard of what you can get them for in Europe, where they come for you know dollars, a dollar or two for a test. Um, and so uh, it would be great if we had rapid tests that were more available and affordable. Um, and, uh, and that's not the case in Canada, certainly not the case currently in BC. So that is our report on rapid antigen tests, and I hope you find it useful.